hard work will get you anywhere. That's what my father said when I was a little girl. Not that he was speaking to me. Any hopes he had were firmly resting on the shoulders of my brother. The best I could hope for, as I was repeatedly told, was to marry well, look after the household, raise a family, just like mother. My father would come home late from the salt works as we were getting ready for bed. He'd ask us if we'd been good, of course, and the answer was always a sickly sweet, yes, Papa, from my sisters, Anne and Louise. He was reeking to high heaven and complaining of his bad back, and he would kiss us on our foreheads and send us up to bed without another word. The life of a labourer seemed preferable to me than that of a dutiful housewife. I was born Emily Stevens on the 30th of March, 1863, in Dodderhill, Droitwich. Childhood was simple, unremarkable, dull. It wasn't until I moved to Newark 20 years later that life for me truly began. The clothing factory on Victoria Street is where my eyes were first open to the world of business. I worked hard, of course, sewing on buttons, adjusting hems, fixing. But my attention was always drawn to the men in dark suits and hats puffing on their cigars. Their eyes furrowed and their heads burrowed in financial papers. How I longed to be amongst them, making and forging a path for myself. I wasn't content with a housewife or factory worker's life lining the velvety pockets of the owner whilst working my fingers to the bone. I wanted to be the one holding the purse strings. Life in Newark was always moving. It was a welcoming place where family and friends could meet, to shop, sit in a pub or cafe, or watch the latest travelling street performer. There was the swimming pool on Tolney Lane, always popular with the youngsters. And, of course, the skating rink and the bioscope at the Corn Exchange. With new forms of entertainment and technology creeping in, it was no wonder that Newark was fast becoming attractive to entrepreneurs and investors. I worked at Cooper's for 20 years. Hard work and disciplined saving meant that I finally had enough to make my first substantial investment a brickworks at a colliery in Dinnington, South Yorkshire. I built a row of houses there. It was not the done thing for a woman at that time, especially one without a husband. But I didn't stop there. I went on to purchase the brickworks at Cross Street near the railway lines. I built more houses so to give my workers a place to live. At 42, I married William Black. A butcher's son, nine years my junior, not that I ever told him that, mind. We lived in a house that I built, but the marriage was mainly for appearance's sake, to be truthful. My businesses came first. I made further investments. I restored the kinema and supervised the whole thing myself. I bought the Chauntry house, and then to the surprise and dismay of everybody in Newark, I demolished it in order to build more houses. Around that time, I met Frank Millhill Johnson, an American with a patent for a special type of metal fixing. It was completely revolutionary in the construction industry at that time. Together, we formed Blag and Johnson Limited, and we set up shop on the Cross Street Brickworks. Well, Frank was a brilliant man. Mad as a hatter, but brilliant. All the local school children would line up at the end of the road to watch him coming to work on his motorised scooter. And he would often make jokes and quips about my humble bicycle. But I told him, I prefer to get where I'm going under my own steam, thank you very much. What a thrill those days were. I would arrive at work each day removing my black boots 
and get on with the tasks for the day, all with a cup of tea and a cigarette in my hand. This venture led to two others, most notably the building of the much-loved Palace Theatre. The workers, the bricks, the money, I supplied the lot. I even climbed up the scaffolding on occasion, just to make sure that everything was as it should be. Not bad for a 57-year-old, I'm sure you'll agree. The Palace was my passion project with appetites for entertainment at an all-time high in Newark, I knew I could make the theatre a roaring success. What a shame then, when I was forced to sell the theatre to Newark Cinemas Limited, before its official opening on the 5th of July 1920. It was one of my life's great regrets. William died in 1919. We were not living together at the time. He was boarding with his mother on Appleton Gate. Sad though I was, my focus was on making Blagg and Johnson a success. However, things took an even more unexpected turn with my business partner Frank's mysterious disappearance, along with a substantial amount of my money. I was left with no funds to make any further investments. Blagg and Johnson stumbled on, but it was an uphill struggle from that moment forward. On the 7th of April, 1935, aged 72, in the comfort of my own home on Lime Grove, I passed away. A combination of cerebral thrombosis and severe bronchitis, the doctor told my brother. As William and I had had no children, Everything I had went to my brother and my sister Louise and various nieces and nephews. I was buried in Newark Cemetery after a very modest funeral. I suspect you're wondering whether I have any regrets. Perhaps looking back, I lament my insatiable appetite for industry. Perhaps I feel sorry that I did not devote more time to my family, my husband, or having children of my own. Truthfully, I cannot see any reason to regret any of it. Certainly, I have not led a blameless life. Flawed, unsentimental, dare I even say, dour, on occasion. Oh yes, all perfectly justified criticisms. But unlike most women of my time, I can say that I have lived my life on nobody else's terms but my own. Not pandering to the expectations of parents or society placed upon me, but living my life independently ambitiously and with a drive to succeed. Hard work will get you anywhere. I think I do agree. <laughs>